Hello, my name is Jet Smith, and I am the head coach for speech and debate at Highland High School in Pocatello, Idaho. And this is a topic lecture for the NSDA's new Lincoln-Douglas debate resolution for January and February, all about open borders. The wording is resolved, justice requires open borders for human migration. The purpose of this video and all others that are on my channel is to make learning about debate more accessible and free to people, particularly within the Idaho community, but I hope that it helps you wherever you are. In this video, we're gonna do a couple of things. First, we'll analyze the resolution, then we'll discuss what frameworks will be viable, then we'll talk about affirmative arguments, and we'll close it out with talking about the negative arguments. So first, let's look at the resolution through five things, trichotomy, definitions, background, the core controversy, and stakeholders. Whenever you get a new resolution, I suggest go through and look at this topic through those five things, and that will give you all of the background information that you need to actually start doing your research for argument and case writing. So first with trichotomy, we're asking ourselves what type of topic is it out of policy factor value? Policy being a claim of action, usually phrased as somebody should or shouldn't do something. Value topics, which are claims of judgment, phrased as this is better than that or this is good according to that. And then fact topics, which are claims of truth, things like this is something or this is not something, this will be something or this won't be something. So this topic is not a policy topic because it doesn't have an actor. It doesn't have any mention of a group or person or mention of an action. If this was a policy topic, it would have been phrased as a just government ought to open its borders for human migration, which is kind of what I wish they would have worded it as, but they didn't. So it's not a policy topic. It looks to me like a combination of a value and a fact topic because it is making a judgment claiming whether or not something is just uh, or part of justice, but it's also talking about the fundamental nature is or isn't justice and what does it require. So I think it's a combination of a value topic and a fact topic. Then let's look at definitions. There are two different things I think everyone's going to need to have definitions at the ready for, and you're going to want to have different definitions depending on what side you're on. So for the affirmative, you want to say that the word requires, because the topic is justice requires open borders for human migration, that you want to say require means to call for as suitable or appropriate. So the example would be the occasion requires formal dress. So if you're going to a fancy party, you say that it would be appropriate and correct for you to dress nicely. Whereas the negative wants to say it's to demand as necessary or essential because the negative can say, if justice requires open borders, then without open borders, there will be no justice ever. And until we get open borders for human migration, nothing is or will be just, which is a much harder barrier for the affirmative to overcome. Whereas if the affirmative can just say, uh, it's appropriate for a, like justice to include uh, open borders for human migration, then I think that will make the debate more of an equal playing field for them. Then the second thing you're going to want to make sure you have definitions for is open borders for human migration. Now, people hear open borders and they think that means absolutely nothing, like there just ceases to be borders. But there's a big difference between no borders and open borders. So an affirmative definition would say policies that allow people to move between countries with little to no restrictions. So very, very few restrictions. Right now, if you want to go across many borders, you have to present all sorts of documentation, you have to apply for visas. There's all sorts of enforcement mechanisms at the border from patrols and walls and fences and things like that. Uh, and so the affirmative says that open borders would be letting people move between countries with very little restrictions or no restrictions. The negative wants to say that open borders for human migration means policies that allow people to move between countries with no restrictions. The problem is the negatives definition does not exist anywhere in the world. And we'll talk about examples of places that have mostly open borders or what would meet an open border under the affirmative definition. But again, if the negative wins their definition, it's going to be much more difficult for the affirmative to win in this debate. So now let's talk about the background. So there are four different types of border policies, largely. There are open borders, which would be absolutely no restrictions Technically, nobody has one of these. There are conditionally open borders, which would be the Schengen Agreement in Europe, which is a collection of countries that 
basically inside this block of countries when you want to move from country a to country b you don't have to do anything to cross between them it's kind of like how you don't have to go past super enforced borders between states that's how it is in this group of countries but if you want to enter into the group of countries they still have a lot of restrictions so there's open borders on the inside when you go between inside country A to inside country B. But if you were trying to come from country C, which is not part of the group and enter into country A, that outer border would still have a lot of patrol. So that's why it's a conditionally open border. Then you have controlled borders, which would be what the United States has, where yes, people can cross the border, but only under extenuating circumstances, if they have lots of documentation, if they have specified reasons, applications, all of those things. This is the most common type of border in the world. Then we have closed borders, which are not very common, but they're very famous when they do exist. The Berlin Wall being the most historical and uh, the most well-known, but also the uh, zone between North Korea and South Korea being a closed border as well, where no one is supposed to go in or out. Then the, another thing you should know is that before World War I, immigration was really common. That's why we hear all the time people in the United States or their ancestors are from all over the world. Uh, and that's because immigration was really, really, really common. And that's largely because border restrictions were not very common. But after 1914, when countries invaded nearby other countries, specifically with Germany invading other countries in Europe, the countries started closing their borders more and more often. And that led us to where we are. Now, the problem that motivated this topic is that there's war all over the world in Ukraine, in Syria, in Iraq, in Turkey. There's economic inequality all over the world. And there's so much oppression from non-democratic and even democratic governments that are causing millions of people to want to leave their homes only to be met with controlled and closed borders uh, that really do not allow people to make it through to try and get a better life. So that's what motivated this topic. So what is the core issue that we are discussing here? I think that you can phrase the topic in a more simple way as are highly restricted borders unfair or do highly restricted borders cause irredeemable harm? So if the affirmative can prove that the answer to either of these questions is yes, then they will probably win. And if the negative can prove that the answer is no, then they will probably win. Finally, is stakeholders. Who has an invested interest in how this plays out? Who would be affected uh, by open borders? Or what would happen if we consider justice to include uh, open borders for human migration? Migrants are the number one stakeholder because the decision would affect their ability and their freedom the most. Uh, citizens of the host country or the country that migrants are trying to enter would also be a stakeholder because that would likely affect their lives, along with businesses and employers. The environment could also be a stakeholder. Governments could also be a stakeholder. But these are the three biggest groups of people uh, who will likely be impacted by uh, open borders for human migration being considered just or unjust. So something else you should note um, about this topic before we segue into talking about framework, when we're looking at analyzing this resolution, the entire debate is about what justice requires. Remember, it's justice requires open borders for human migration. It's not about political or government action. It's not phrased as a just government would open its border or states ought to open their borders. It doesn't say that. So we're not debating about whether one or some governments do that. And then also, this debate is not about non-justice related consequences or duties. So it's not that utilitarianism and deontological theories aren't applicable on this topic. It's that if you cannot connect every single impact in your debate back to justice, then it's not really part of the topic or it doesn't answer the resolutional question because the debate is about what justice requires, not what would be more good than bad, not what we're morally obligated to do. Uh, unless you can prove that what justice means is doing more good than harm or what justice means is doing what you're morally obligated to do. So it all has to connect back to justice. So now let's talk about framework. Remember, in Lincoln-Douglas debate, we have four main things that we're looking at. So we have offense, which are your contentions, as well as your turns to your opponent's contention. You have the value criterion, which is how you are measuring achievement of your value premise. You have the side that you're on that the judge can vote for. And then you have the value premises, which are the ultimate uh, 
ethical good that you think the judge should try to achieve. So the way that you pick up judges in a Lincoln-Douglas debate is you win your offense or you win offensive arguments. Then you say that those offensive arguments apply to a criterion for measuring the achievement of the value premise, which proves that you should vote for one side or another in order to achieve that value premise. So another analogy for this would be, think of the judge as wanting to get into the best room that they possibly can. And each value premise presented to them in the debate is a room. So if both teams have the same value, then there's one room. If both teams have a different value, then there's two rooms. In order to get into that room, they have to go through a door. And there's two doors to each room. There's the affirmative door and there's the negative door that they can walk through to get into that room. But if they want to walk through the door to be able to get inside, they have to be able to unlock the door. And the lock on the door is like the value criterion, the thing that determines uh, whether or not something matters to actually achieving what we want, which is getting into that room. But how do you unlock the door? You unlock the door using a key, which would be your offense. So by winning offensive arguments that link back to a value criterion that can prove that your side is correct, that is how the judge will end up voting for you to achieve that value premise. So we are going to talk about value. Technically, there's more than one that you could read, but really you should only be reading one. Uh, and then we'll talk about the different criterions or criteria, whatever the plural is. So justice is going to be the most common and correct, in my opinion, value on this topic, because the topic is about what justice itself requires. This can be defined as giving each their due. It's also shorthanded as fairness. So I think justice is pretty, it's pretty obvious why it should be the ultimate value, because how can you determine what justice requires through a value that is not justice? Uh, that's what the point of the criterion would be, is to tell you what justice requires. So what are some other values that people will probably read anyways, because they want to throw a curveball or they think justice is boring? They might read a value of human rights, but I think that that's not a great idea because it's not in the topic. Human rights or rights in general are not listed anywhere. It's not universally agreed upon what human rights are or how important it is to protect human rights. So it's not a universal value like justice is. And I think human rights serves better as a criterion for justice than it does as its own value. Then you have the cost benefit analysis of values, which is quality of life and societal welfare. Again, I wouldn't read these because they're not in the topic. They're basically meaningless. Give me one example of an impact that doesn't matter under quality of life or societal welfare. You probably can't, which means if your value includes everything, it's meaningless. And also, who says that you have to have quality of life or that your society has to be doing well for justice to exist? So I don't see how valuing this proves the topic true or false. Governmental legitimacy, similar problems. It's not in the topic. There's no mention of governments. And also it's not required for justice. If it is, then use it as a value criterion. And then lastly, I could see some people wanting to value freedom. But again, freedom is not in the topic. It's not a universal end. Freedom for freedom's sake is not something universally agreed upon. Otherwise, we would be free to do whatever we want. And also it's not necessarily required for justice. So I really think that the only value it makes sense to read on this topic is justice. Where you're going to get your clash on the framework debate is the criterion that you choose to use to measure justice, or if you want to have some value clash, maybe you define justice in a different way using a different philosophy of it. So how can we measure the achievement of justice based on the side of the debate that you're on, so or the arguments that are being made? Here are five examples of philosophies that you could write criterions from that I think would work really well in this resolution in no particular order. The first one being human rights theory. So the idea that human rights are important, that they need to be respected. So your criterion for uh, how do you know if you're getting the justice on my side or my opponent's side, the criterion would be phrased as respecting or maximizing human rights. The second one would be structural violence theories. So the idea that structural violence is inherently unjust and therefore we need to get rid of it whenever possible. So a good criterion would be resisting structural violence. A lot of people say minimizing structural violence but minimizing makes it sound like we want it to still exist just in smaller forms. So when you say resisting structural violence, it's a much easier line to prove that you are achieving. 
uh, than eliminating structural violence would be. Third, you have Rawlsianism or Rawlsian justice from philosopher John Rawls, which you could phrase as your criterion is benefiting the least well off. You could also do acting consistently with the veil of ignorance or the idea that whenever we make a decision, we should pretend as though we have no idea who we are or who we would be. We could be the richest person in the society. We could be the poorest person in the society. We could be somebody at the very bottom end or the top end of the totem pole, which means that we will make decisions that would benefit the least well off in case we ended up being the least well off. Um, or you could phrase it as ensuring consistency with the difference principle, which says anytime that there is inequality, then the inequality should be to the benefit of those that are the least well off. So these are three things that go towards the same thing, but you could phrase it the criterion differently depending on what kind of style or strategy you wanted to use. Fourth is retributivism or retributive justice, which is a form of justice that is centered around punishment and crime prevention. So you could talk about ensuring proportionate punishment. So how do you know if you are achieving justice, if you are ensuring that punishment is correct, as in the correct people are being punished and they are being punished in the correct way and the correct amount, uh, and vice versa, that the wrong people are not being punished. Fifth and finally, we have egalitarianism, uh, which is, or equality, which is the idea of respecting people as equals, is one way that you could phrase it. You could also phrase it as maximizing equality or resisting inequality. Uh, I just think that the first way of phrasing it might be a little bit more specific. So all of these are different branches of philosophy that you could use to form your value criterion. And the reason why you want to get your criterion from philosophy is, one, that's what a lot of traditional judges expect. But two, the point of philosophy is to explain important concepts in our world and tell us uh, what we care about and what we don't care about. And when you use philosophy to justify your criterion, you have a much better shot at proving that it's better than just something like cost-benefit analysis. You also want to phrase your criterion as a action and then like, like so respecting, maximizing, minimizing, ensuring, uh, instead of just saying, my criterion is retributivism because that doesn't give the judge anything to do with it. But if the judge knows I vote for the team that ensures proportionate punishment, then that makes their decision a lot easier. The idea is going back to our door room analogy is that the criterion is a lock on the door. So you tell the judge, if you want to unlock this door, you have to go through the side that ensures proportionate punishment. And how do the judge know if the your side ensures proportionate punishment? Based off of the arguments that you give them, aka your contentions or your turns, aka your keys. So now let's talk about affirmative arguments on the topic, which are reasons why justice does require open borders for human migration. I have 10 arguments for the affirmative and 10 arguments for the negative. They are in alphabetical order. So the first argument idea is border danger, and this could be phrased in a lot of different ways. You could do border violence, um, but the premise of the argument is that borders are really bad, at least with the way that they're structured now, uh, and that they are dangerous. People lack access to shelter, to food, to water, to all of their basic necessities, and that there are lots of violent border patrols that kill and harm people for trying to immigrate uh, without going through the proper channels. So how do you solve this or what's the link to solving this argument as the affirmative? When we adopt a policy of open borders where there's very little to no restrictions, then you're going to remove the dangers of crossing. You're not going to see the same level of violence. You can look to examples like immigration or migration between um, Australia and New Zealand, between India and Nepal, between countries within the Schengen Agreement, all of those are places where there just isn't the level of border violence that we have here. And then the impact, every impact should be phrased as something that relates back to justice, right? And if justice is giving people what they deserve, then your impact can either be phrased as people deserve or people don't deserve, blah, 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 or blah, blah, blah is just, or blah, blah, blah isn't, or is unjust. So the impact would be something along the lines of, People don't deserve to die for trying to improve their lives or dying for trying to improve your life is unjust. Second argument area is economic opportunity. So the premise of this one is that people are struggling economically all over the world right now and they're losing access to high quality paying and dignity uh, jobs and education opportunities as well. But with open borders, then if your country doesn't have those opportunities, you can go somewhere that does and 
the impact being people deserve the opportunity to improve their lives, or it is just for people to have the opportunity to improve their lives. Third, escaping climate change. Uh, climate change being a huge issue. Climate change was almost a topic. In fact, this argument was almost a topic. One of the other resolution choices was something along the lines of uh, the European Union is responsible or morally obligated to accept climate refugees. And so climate refugees are people who have to flee their homes, their lands, or their country due to the impacts of climate change. So the problem is that is happening more now than ever, and it will continue to happen more as climate change gets worse. But open borders lets innocent people flee the impacts of climate change. And the reason why that affects the topic is because most of the time, climate refugees are people who are not contributing the most to climate change, but they are affected the worst by climate change. And people don't deserve to be harmed by a problem like climate change that they didn't cause. Fourth, we have escaping oppression. So no country on earth is perfect. Every country in some way has laws that are to the detriment of some citizens, but many countries have legal systems or cultural systems that are so stacked against people based on different aspects of who they are as a person that staying there much longer is a threat to their safety or their health, be it mental or physical. And so in order to be able to escape those problems, open borders would let people leave those countries that have the oppressive laws and have the oppressive governments to go somewhere they, where they would be treated better. So this could be applied to people living under a dictatorship like in North Korea, but it could also be applied to people living in a country where being part of the LGBT community could get you sentenced to death or put in prison. And then the impact is that people don't deserve to be oppressed or oppression or inequality is unjust. Then we have fifth family separation, which might be the most common or the first thing that a lot of people think of, at least in the United States for this topic. And the idea is that closed borders and controlled borders separate and destroy families because they split people up. Some people make it in, some people don't, or one person goes to a country to try and earn money to send back to their families because the rest of their families couldn't get the correct visas or it was too dangerous to bring them. So families get separated, which is harmful for both the adults and the children in said family. So by opening borders, then families would be able to be together again. And the impact is that people deserve to be with their families or families being together is just. Sixth, we have fleeing conflict. Fleeing conflict, the idea that there are wars and battles and attacks going on in places all over the world, particularly in Ukraine and in the Middle East, which are scaring and harming people and causing millions to become refugees, but the refugees are being turned away more and more often. But a lot of the times they wouldn't be refugees if they could just migrate freely without having to apply for refugee status. And open borders would allow people to escape the wars, the conflict, the fighting, and go somewhere that is experiencing peace. The impact being people don't deserve to die or be harmed in wars that they can't escape, or dying in a war that you can't escape and had no part in is unjust. Seventh, freedom of movement. Freedom of movement. This freedom of movement, I expect to be pretty big on the topic because there's a lot of philosophical debate back and forth on it. But the premise is that people cannot choose where they are born, right? You don't have any say before you're born of where you're going to end up. So why should you face less opportunities or have a worse life because of something that was completely out of your control, essentially a lottery system? So open borders gives people the freedom of movement to go somewhere where they were not born, similar to the opportunity argument, but also just the idea that holding people down takes away one of their fundamental rights and the ability to go where you please uh, is a fundamental right that humans should have. And so the impact being people deserve the freedom of movement or the freedom of movement is just. Then we have labor shortages. This is an economic argument for the affirmative. I expect there to be lots of economic arguments on the negative. So this is one way that you can kind of turn that story back over to your side. So the idea is that a lot of countries, especially in the United States, have more job openings than they have people to be able to fulfill those jobs. And in a lot of countries where populations are going down due to a lack of immigration and people having fewer children, 
An open borders policy would allow migrant workers from other countries where there might not be enough jobs to move to a country where there are not enough people to be able to fill those jobs where they're needed. And the impact being when those jobs are filled, everybody's life gets better. Having a job means that you can feed your family. Doing the job means that you provide goods and services to other people. So access to goods and services provided by willing migrant workers is just or people deserve access to those goods and services. Ninth is settler colonialism. If you're looking to take a more critical approach on this topic as the affirmative, I think this is a really great place to do it. This was an argument that popped up under the immigration policy debate topic back when I was in high school, uh, or no, the year after I graduated is when this was a topic, I believe. Yeah, so the immigration topic was the United States federal government should substantially reduce its restrictions on legal immigration to the United States. And one F that people read was blood quantum or the idea that often indigenous tribes if they cannot prove their indigeneity would be denied access to moving freely back and forth between lands uh, that were once part of their ancestral home or just the idea that because indigenous people do not get dual citizenship uh, between countries they can't visit parts of people from their tribe in one country past a border and then go back home to where they're from easily. So the argument would be that because indigenous people are denied the ability to travel across their borders, open borders is a just policy uh, or open borders for human migration is just in general because it gives people access to their land of origin and it uh, reduces some of the harm or mitigates some of the harm that has been done by settler colonialism. Finally, for the affirmative, we have social cohesion. This is an argument stating that we are all human, all people are people, but people don't always know one another very well because we tend to separate ourselves. And borders are one aspect of that separation, where they separate us based on our race, our language, our culture. But if we have open borders, then populations will become more diverse and more integrated of people with different backgrounds. And the impact being people deserve to be surrounded by people both similar and different from themselves. And that diversification and melting pot of sorts is just. Now that we've talked about reasons why justice does require open borders for human migration, let's switch to talking about the negative or reasons why justice does not require open borders for human migration. I also have 10 arguments for this side. The first negative argument is brain drain, and I see this as being very common. I suspect many people will read this argument on the negative, and that is the idea that border restrictions make it so that if you have an advanced degree or if you have levels of training or you perform a job that is uncommon and at the higher end of the pay scale or of the skill scale in your country, uh, border restrictions make it so that you are more likely to stay in that country and that your fellow citizens and your government will benefit from that work. But when we open borders, then chances are people in, uh, I don't want to say lesser developed, but in less economically strong countries, the highest skilled workers will want to leave to go to countries with more economic opportunities, and it will cause a flowing away of all of the best and brightest workers and students away from countries that arguably need them more. The impact being people don't deserve their high skilled uh, or educated citizens to just leave them behind or for their country to suffer because of it. Second negative argument is disease spread. This is an argument like many others on the negative that I think you'll need to be very careful about how you phrase it because the argument is not immigrants are dirty and carry diseases. The argument is that under a situation like we saw with COVID-19, borders or controlled borders allowed for us to slow the spread of the disease, at least some, because restrictions on migration prevented people from bringing uh, an outbreak of something like COVID from one place to another place. But if we have open borders and we say that, you know, it's unjust for borders to not be open, then that means it would, in future pandemics or outbreaks of COVID or any other disease, the disease would spread at all or it would spread even faster. And the impact is that is unjust because people don't deserve to die from diseases that could have been slowed or mitigated. Third is environmental harm. Borders right now protect endangered species and prevent population density from getting too high. So if people have to go in in very specific controlled ways uh, and only certain people can come in and only a certain amount of people can come in, then you can keep 
the land along the border protected environmentally, but you can also prevent certain ecosystems from getting overcrowded with species, uh, too many people depending on a limited amount of resources. So open borders would cause overconsumption of resources in areas with high migration rates, as well as it would probably disrupt the environment along the border in places that are now more open. And then the impact being that animals and plants uh, and the environment in general, people too, don't deserve to be harmed by environmental problems caused by migrants. Fourth, increased crime. This will also likely be a very common argument, but I think it's another argument you have to be very careful with how you phrase it. There are way too many studies out there that prove that immigrants are not inherently criminal or that migrants are way more likely to commit crimes than anyone else. In fact, there's lots of studies that say the opposite. However, there is an argument to be made that borders can stop wanted criminals from escaping uh, or and entering the country to avoid justice because in order for them to get through, they'd have to pass a whole bunch of checkpoints uh, and they'd have to apply for something, have a background check run on them. But those background checks probably would not exist in a world of open borders where there's very little restrictions. It also means uh, if people wanted to commit crimes more easily by going to a country uh, that maybe had less policing resources, then they would be able to enter that country now because of open borders where they wouldn't have been able to before. So it would allow criminals to escape prosecution, but also give criminals access to new targets uh, in a new place. And the impact being people don't deserve to be harmed by criminals that could have been stopped. And the impact being um, criminals deserve to be punished. Fifth, labor displacement. Again, another argument that will likely be very common, but something you should be very careful about. It is not proper uh, or kind or respectful to say that immigrants are just trying to come and take our jobs or that migrants are just job stealing people. But the argument could be made that in certain low skilled fields that don't require high amounts of training or education in order to get jobs, uh, that migrants who fall into needing those kinds of jobs will move to a country that has a lot or a limited amount of those and then there will be too many people and not enough jobs to go around regardless of who is trying to get them and those jobs are already disappearing due to automation so if too many people are moving to a place to get a limited number of jobs then we're going to see a lot of people losing their jobs and living in poverty because they lost their opportunities which you could argue people don't deserve or is unjust Sixth is a critical argument for the negative side. Uh, this is the no borders critique. If you are looking to out left the affirmative, then this is the way that you're going to do it. So the affirmative has to defend the existence of borders. Those borders just have to be open, which means very little or no restrictions. So they still defend the idea that, you know, this set territories for this country and this set territories for this country, and we are separate things. Whereas a no borders critique would say that because the affirmative is defending the existence of borders through their affirmation, that is really bad because borders are inherently violent and guarantee inequality for a lot of different reasons. So the alternative uh, perspective that the negative would adopt is justice requires the abolition of borders rather than the opening of borders. Seventh, you could read a populist backlash disadvantage on the immigration topic for policy that happened the year after I graduated. Disadvantages were really hard to come by because the literature disagreed with almost all of the most common reasons people don't like immigration or people complain about immigration. So one of the disadvantages that people came up with was populist backlash. And that's the idea that some, I'm specifying some conservative people and oftentimes, but not always white people uh, that happen to be conservative can hold really intense anti-immigrant attitudes uh, about things like they're only here to steal our jobs, they're spreading diseases, they're here to commit crimes, they hate our country, very extremist attitudes. And the idea is that if you adopt an open borders policy, or if open borders are deemed as the just thing to do, then that will cause huge amounts of anger and backlash from people who hold these anti-immigrant ideas. And that will likely cause an uptick in hate crimes, as well as discriminatory laws in communities where the majority of people have these ideas against migrants. And the impact is that that discrimination, that violence against migrant people that will likely increase after an open borders policy is unjust. Eighth, we have the reduce restrictions counter plan. I think that this is a very smart argument and it will also likely be very common. And that is saying 
instead of opening borders being required for justice, what justice actually requires is substantially reducing unjust restrictions on human migration. So you were to read a counter plan or a counter resolution or a counter statement of value uh, and call it justice requires substantially reducing unjust restrictions on human migration. And I would have which restrictions you think we should get rid of ready to go. And this works because you can say you can't have fully open borders and conditionally open borders at the same time. So if you are the negative, you can say we should lose these restrictions and keep these restrictions. The affirmative can't say, why don't we do both? Because that doesn't make any sense. You can't lose all of the restrictions and still have some of them at the same time. Why is this better? Well, most of the other negative arguments you could read on this topic would go with this counter plan, and you say that reducing restrictions takes away most of the problems that the affirmative will likely talk about, while avoiding a lot of the problems that the negative could talk about. So it all just depends on which restrictions you choose to keep and which you choose to get rid of, so that you can strategically take out part of the affirmative case while still managing to have your own. Ninth is straining services. So there are social services that most countries try to provide their citizens, whether through the private sector, the public sector, uh, or the nonprofit sector. And that is things like education, healthcare, and housing assistance. The problem is in many countries like the United States, those things are drastically underfunded or they're barely funded so that they can keep surviving. We don't try to throw money at those uh, things excessively. But if you open borders, then there will be so many people migrating to countries, even whether they have really good education, healthcare, and housing systems, or they don't. Uh, and that means that way more people will need access to those services, but there's not enough time or enough money or enough people to staff and provide those, which could lead to a collapse of the entire system or just make the entire system function way worse. The impact being losing service to or losing access to social services because of an overwhelmed system that comes from opening borders uh, is unjust. Tenth and finally, we have the idea of terrorist attacks. The last negative argument is again a controversial one, one that I think will be common, but you also need to be careful of. Claiming that everyone who tries to come into a country is there to attack them in terrorist ways is a surefire way to lose a lot of debates and lose a lot of respect. However, you can argue that border restrictions prevent terrorists from entering countries uh, because it's difficult to enter into a country with a controlled border in general. And also if you have engaged in activities that have labeled you as being on the no-fly zone, for example, if you wouldn't be able to fly on a plane uh, inside a country, then perhaps it is safer to make sure that those restrictions prevent people uh, who harbor those attitudes from coming into a country. However, if you open borders, then it would be way easier for people with terrorist ideologies and plans to enter and leave the country. Uh, whether it be before they attack or after they attack, thanks to borders being open, and the impact being people don't deserve to be harmed by violent acts of terrorism that could have been prevented because doing so is unjust. So before we finish the video, I wanted to make a couple more notes about different things on the topic that I didn't include under definitions, but just things you should be aware of. So when we say justice requires open borders for human migration. It's important to understand human migration just means people leaving and entering. It doesn't mean goods and services. Uh, so any arguments about how this means that there will be more drugs entering a country don't necessarily make sense because it's not about you can just bring products uh, or things of any kind that you want. It's all about people having the ability to kind of come and go as they please. I also think it's important to remember that no country in the world has fully, fully open borders uh, where there's zero restrictions at all. However, many different places have conditionally open borders, at least internally. So in the Schengen countries, imagine there's a whole bunch of countries in a circle like this. And if you want to enter the circle, you have to go through a bunch of restrictions. But once you're in the circle, moving between countries that are in the circle, it's very easy to do so. That is the type of open borders that currently exists. So if you expect the affirmative to have to prove that it's been done before and worked where there's zero restrictions ever, then that's probably too high of a burden for them to be able to meet because it's never happened before. 
Remember at the end of the day that while this topic concerns a very important issue, it also concerns a very sensitive issue. And whether you're on the affirmative or the negative, ask yourself in every single debate round if people in the room were migrants or immigrants, uh, would I say this argument still? And if you wouldn't say that argument, if there were people who were migrants in the room, ask yourself why and ask yourself if, if that is an argument that is uh, appropriate or kind. Because sometimes just because something sounds strategic doesn't mean that it's worth saying in a debate round. I think that the literature on this topic will be slightly better for the affirmative, but I think that people's gut reactions will be slightly better for the negative, so it will balance out. I hope that this does not just turn into a, well, require means this and require means that debate, kind of like how the last topic turned into a, well, you can do both on the affirmative, environmental protection and economic growth. No, you can do both on the negative, environmental protection and economic growth. Don't run away from clash. Read arguments that go to the heart of the topic rather than trying to get the best of both worlds. And with that, I hope that you enjoyed and I wish you the best of the luck for the next two months.